We're going to begin our afternoon program right now. In your program, it says that our next speaker was going to be introduced by Mary Jo Binker. Unfortunately, Mary Jo took ill and is unable to be with us here today. So it is um, the honor of introducing Professor Maurer Falls to me. Professor Maurer is no stranger to these conferences. He's a very popular speaker with us. So just to recap, he is the Alfred Thayer Mahan Distinguished Professor of Sea Power and Grand Strategy at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and we are happy to welcome him back to the Churchill Conference. John. Thank you, very much. thank you, David, for that introduction, and thank you, Lee, for inviting me here. It is always a great pleasure and honor to be here with the International Churchill Society and be able to speak about Winston Churchill. Now, the theme of this conference has been about the end of the Cold War, the, looking at the anniversary of the uh, Berlin Wall coming down. Churchill, of course, in a very famous speech at MIT, said they could look forward to the time when communism would end. Well, today, this year, is also another important anniversary that we should remember. And that is, it is the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe. And so this is a, an event, a time, that should be remembered as well. So what I'm going to speak about this afternoon is to look at Churchill's views about why this second Armageddon, as he called it, came about. That's my topic today. And what I want to do is look at the choices that were open to Britain's leaders during the 1930s, what they might have done to avert this Second World War, or if they couldn't avert it, how best to prepare Britain for the trial of strength with Nazi Germany that was to come. Well, uh, I wrote about this recently to mark the 80th anniversary, an article in the journal Orbis, a journal of world affairs published by the Foreign Policy Research Institute in Philadelphia. There are copies of it, hard copies, that are in the room with the books if you choose to read uh, the article that I've written about this subject. And I, in that article, I try to draw out some policy implications for today, what we can learn from the 1930s. Unfortunately, today, too many people say that the 1930s are such a unique period in history, that Hitler is such a, a remarkable, strange individual, that the events of the 1930s somehow can't be replicated. Well, of course, history doesn't repeat itself. But at the same time, at the same time, there are so many lessons to be learned from the study of the 1930s. So we have to pay attention to those lessons. Those lessons are of vital importance for us today when we think about the international environment in which we live and our domestic politics as well. Well, as I said, Churchill said that there could hardly have been a war more easy to prevent than this second Armageddon. That is one of the theses of his book, The Gathering Storm, the first volume of his six volume history of the Second World War. Now, when we look at the 1930s, we say, oh, is that right? That's a, that's a really tough thesis to have to prove. Everything seems overdetermined. You have Versailles, then you have, of course, the great economic catastrophe, the Great Depression, that brought Hitler to power on January 30th, 1933, in Germany, that that in turn sort of sets in train motion toward war, that war is inevitable in some way. Well, Churchill took issue with that inevitability theme, that thesis that somehow the war was inevitable. He argues in the first volume of his Second World War, The Gathering Storm, that the war could have been avoided. So I'm going to look at some of those choices today of how the war could have been avoided. Well, Hitler, a revolutionary, extremist, nationalist, racist, comes to power in Germany. A great deal of his agenda can be read in his book, Mein Kampf, that came out in the 1920s. Uh, when you read Mein Kampf, it's amazing how he laid out so much of what his aims, ambitions, and his strategies were to achieve those ambitions. Uh, in the book, you will read 
that Germany will become a world power or cease to exist. Hitler's ambition is to make Germany a superpower, we would say. The terminology of the time, world power. A country as great as Britain or the United States on the world scene. He understands that this challenge is eventually going to bring Germany into conflict with the British Empire and with the United States. Here's Hitler with a young boy. How old is he? 12? 13? Isn't this a creepy photograph? <laughs> look at him. He has his arms around that young boy. And look at his eyes. Wow, that almost looks like demonic possession. Here it is, Halloween. Well, look at that. And you look what it, it, this photograph. It's so, it tells us an important story, doesn't it? I've got your children. It's the Pied Piper. He's coming and taking the children away. And what's going to happen to this young boy? Well, we know the story, don't we? He's going to die in the frozen streets of Stalingrad. Or he's going to be killed in a submarine in the North Atlantic. Or shot down over Britain, right? That's what's going to happen to that generation. The Nazi movement was very popular with young people in Germany. The Nazi movement targeted young people because at the time of the Depression, they're the ones that are dissatisfied with the system. And of course, when you have young men, 15 to 30, who are dissatisfied, well, you get political turbulence and you have danger. That's just simple demographics 101, isn't it? Young men who are unhappy, who don't have a leadership life uh, in their life, father or uncle or older brother killed on the Western Front in the First World War, who do they look up to? Well, a decorated World War I veteran, Adolf Hitler. He becomes the adult male figure for a young generation of Germans. And again, they are going to become loyal to him right down to the very end in Berlin in 1945. Well, Churchill right away recognized what was wrong here, that an extremist regime had come into power in Germany. And so in a speech in the House of Commons, he laid out and said, one of the things that we all had been told, that as long as the Weimar Republic, democracy thrived in Germany, that Britain would be safe. Well, that's all changed. It's all changed. Democracy has been overthrown. It's all been swept away. Instead, what did Churchill say? A dictatorship, a most grim dictatorship. That's Shakespearean, isn't it? It's right out of Hamlet. You have not only murder, but murder most foul. You know, recently the Folger had that wonderful exhibit of Churchill and uh, Shakespeare, wonderful exhibit. You can hear here the echoes of Shakespeare. Yes, a very grim dictatorship in Germany. Well, let's look at the choices. I'm going to lay out three choices that were open to British leaders at this time. Choice one, armaments. We've heard about the Cold War arms race. Well, there was also an arms race during the 1930s. And it's an arms race that Churchill believed Britain had to win. There's something worse than an arms race, and that is losing an arms race. Losing an arms race to a country like Nazi Germany. In particular, command of the air. The competition, the arms race and air armaments was critical to Churchill. He understood that on the land, France was going to have to bear the main burden of fighting Germany. At sea, Britain already had a substantial lead over Germany. But in the air, in the air, there you have a direct competition. Both homelands, Germany and Britain, can be bombed by the other. So these two countries now competing in the air, this is of decisive importance. In the Second World War, command of the air was essential for any successful ground campaign, like the cross-channel attack. It was also essential for winning the Battle of the Atlantic. If you lost command of the air, you would lose the battle. It's critical, and Churchill understood this. As you know, he was an air enthusiast. Uh, David Freeman has put together a wonderful edition uh, of, uh, I think it's the last uh, edition, current issue of uh, Finest Hour that deals with uh, air power, Churchill and air power. 
uh, well worth reading. Well, the Nazis understood this, and you see a massive expansion of the German aircraft industry during the 1930s. Look at this, in a short period of time, Germany comes from having a, a rudimentary aircraft industry to where they have built up, built up the infrastructure, the industry, to compete in the air against Britain. Churchill understood this. He understood this, that this buildup of German air power had to, be, had to be met. Now, in 1932, Stanley Baldwin, the leading political figure in interwar Britain, and very honest, said to the British people, whenever the British people are told they have to remember, that man in the street, that the bomber will always get through. This is what the stakes are. And indeed, in the Second World War, the bomber did get through to attack the British homeland, to attack also the German homeland and the Japanese homeland. Uh, we have to remember that in 1940, from August of 1940 around to December of 1940, when the Battle of Britain is being fought, when the Blitz is hitting the British homeland, that about 25,000 British civilians were killed, were killed by German air attacks. Think about that in perspective for Americans in relation to September 11th. It's about seven times the damage, if measured in life, that Britain is taking uh, at this time. It gives you some idea of the punishment that the bomber could inflict on the homelands of great powers at this time. Churchill understood this. He warned about this danger. 1934, he gives a speech. He said, we have to have a big vote to double the Royal Air Force and then have another vote and have it now and then double it again. That was his argument. Germany's making this leap ahead in air power. Britain has to keep pace, at least parity, at least parity in strength with Germany at this time. Well, Neville Chamberlain, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time, before becoming Prime Minister, 1937, he said, what are the risks to the country? Well, there's a threat from Germany, but we're just coming out of the Depression. It's the economy, stupid, to quote an advisor to former President Bill Clinton. Uh, that's what's important. That's the biggest risk. You don't want to uh, spend so much on armaments that you hurt the British economic recovery from the Depression. The economic problem, restoring the good health of the economy, is more important in priorities for the government than building up air power relative to Germany. And there's a good argument to be made for that. A healthy economy is the basis for military power. And so Chamberlain is not wrong in that regard. But nonetheless, by focusing so much on the priority of restoring the economy, putting that as the top priority relative to the German uh, air buildup, Britain starts to fall behind. Now, in being critical of Neville Chamberlain, understand that to his left, the Labour Party thought that Chamberlain and the national government were doing too much. In a speech at the House of Commons, Clement Attlee, who would later become Deputy Prime Minister and loyal Lieutenant to Winston Churchill in the Second World War, he says that the Labour Party denies the need for a big build-up in air power. Again, look at his words in the House of Commons. We deny the proposition that the Royal Air Force will make for the peace of the world. Churchill is 180 degrees out from that. He believes that a strong Britain, militarily, will be able to help preserve the peace. It's the best way of trying to preserve the peace. So you can see that we can criticize Neville Chamberlain, but the Labour Party was even more wrong, if you will, at this time, in opposition to what Churchill was arguing at the time. Now, here are some graphs. We have to have some graphs, don't we? OK. This gives you an idea of what defense spending was in the 1930s. In 1932 and 1933, Britain was basically spending double that of Germany. Germany is still restricted in its armaments by the Treaty of Versailles. They are spending about 1 to 1.5% 1 of gross domestic product on their armed forces, much like today's Germany spends about the same amount of money relative to the economy. But as you can see, by 1934 and 35 and 36 and 37, 38, Germany is starting to outspend, outspends Britain considerably. It's only in 1940, after war has been declared, does Britain 
start to overtake Germany in armament spending. The British case, like many democracies, is that you declare and then prepare rather than the other way around. Here's another way of looking at that graph. You can see the delta that builds up here. Again, the heavy German investment in their armed forces is giving them an advantage. Germany is winning the interwar arms race. Again, it's a race that Britain really can't afford to lose. Now, what does this mean? Well, in August of 1939, Hitler tells his generals, right before the attack on Poland, he tells his assembled uh, generals, he says, what's the military situation in Britain right now? England's vulnerable to air attack. Hitler knows that Germany has stolen a march on Britain. They are temporarily ahead in air armaments. It's the time to strike. And again, he tells his generals that we have three times the personnel in the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, to the Royal Air Force. Again, there's a window of opportunity here that Nazi Germany has to go with. By losing the arms race, you open up an opportunity for Hitler to strike. And he understands he has to strike before Britain, before Britain is able to catch up. Well, what's the takeaway? Losing an arms race can lead to war. Again, we should remember that these arms competitions matter. They matter a great deal. Choice number two, alliances. Can Britain reach out to other powers? In particular, we've heard about that special relationship between the United States and Britain. In the First World War, Britain and the associated power, the United States, formed a coalition with France. The Atlantic democracies worked together to beat Imperial Germany. By the end of the First World War Armistice Day, there were over two million American soldiers fighting in France. The American army in France was larger than the French army in France in 1918. Again, the U.S. is playing a critical role in winning that war. And here you see a poster from a month or so after Armistice Day in 1918 for a rally in New York City. And you can see side by side Britannia with Uncle Sam. And there's Uncle Sam with his saber and the eagle and the British lion and Britannia with her trident hold, held high. These two countries, the British Empire and the United States work together. The peace of the world is secure. Alas, it didn't work out that way. Now, during the First World War, Churchill understood the importance of the U.S. intervention. He told Admiral Sims, our top naval commander in Europe, uh, uh, he told Admiral Sims, he said, if the U.S. had not entered this war, the Allies, Britain and France, would lose it. That's what he told Admiral Sims. In a speech in 1916, he told an audience, he said, there are two ways of winning this war. This is the First World War, remember, I'm talking about. And they both begin with the letter A. What are those words? Well, one is airplanes, and the other, America. You want to understand Churchill's strategy in the Second World War? Well, here it is being formed in the First World War. Airplanes and America. This is what's going to be decisive in beating back a challenge from Germany. Churchill understands this. To understand the history of the Second World War, you have to know about the First World War. The experiences that Franklin D. Roosevelt had. By the way, he was an early interventionist. He disagreed with President Wilson. He wanted to see the U.S. in the war sooner than what Wilson wanted to take the country into the war. And also Churchill, understanding America's importance, and also this new technology of airplanes, how important they were. Well, Neville Chamberlain had to deal with the U.S. on a whole range of matters, from currency to dealing with war debts. And he confided to one of his sisters, well, Americans, it's a nation of cads. Oh, I'm upset by that. <laughs> I'm a cad. Anyway, isn't that a wonderful word, cad? We don't use it anymore, do we? Maybe we should use it some more. Well, anyway, I, th here's, here's Neville Chamberlain, again, one of the leading British political figures, the man who is bringing Britain out of the Great Depression. But he doesn't see cooperation with the U.S. as something that's feasible. The U.S. is not particularly cooperative with Britain. And hence, they are a nation of cads. 
Uh, by the way, when, Theodore, um, when President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt's son, uh, James, came over to the UK in 1933, he wanted to meet with Stanley Baldwin, again, the leading political figure in Britain at the time. And uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, again, recorded in a letter to uh, one of his sisters, said that SB, Stanley Baldwin, he's come to loathe Americans so much he doesn't want to meet with them. He doesn't want to meet with James Roosevelt. Now, he does meet with James Roosevelt, but again, this is what he's thinking. Baldwin, Neville Chamberlain, Americans are not cooperative. They're not helping the situation of economic recovery or international security. Now, Churchill had uh, James Roosevelt out to Chartwell. And uh, uh, the young Roosevelt said, if you could have any wish, what would you want to have? And of course, what's his wish? You know, it's like Aladdin. Uh, you know, you have, I want a thousand wishes. That's what you ask for. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, anyway. anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, when, 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 when Churchill is asked, what, what would he, he said, well, of course he's going to say, I want to be prime minister. Right? You want to get to the top of the greasy pole. And he says, what else? He wants to be in close daily telephone, that new technology, uh, with the President of the United States. That's what he wants. Again, he has a different picture of the U.S. and just how important it is that Britain and the United States be together. And as he says um, uh, to Roosevelt's son, he said, you know, there's nothing that, uh, that, that they can't accomplish if the U.S. and Britain work together. And that's important. And also that personal relationship between the Prime Minister and the President of the United States. You know, we've talked about symmetry today. Again, for leaders to get to know each other, to build trust, to cooperate with each other, to take each other's pulse, to measure them as leaders, and then build up that trust and confidence that goes beyond uh, the, just the basic calculations of strength of countries. Well, anyway, uh, What's uh, Neville Chamberlain's view of the U.S.? Well, in 1934, Britain and the U.S. are trying to pressure Japan to limit Japan's naval armaments. And Neville Chamberlain says, you know, we can't trust the Americans on any of this. A common U.S.-British front, it, it won't work. The Americans will never come through for us. In fact, you know, they, they will always back away from us. They, will, they won't stand with us and try to resist together with us, aggression. The only way the U.S. will come into the war if there's an attack on Hawaii or Honolulu. This is 1934, he says this. This is seven years before Pearl Harbor. How did Neville Chamberlain, he must have looked into the crystal ball or something to come up with that one. I mean, pretty amazing. But he said the only way the Americans will come in and help us against Japan is if uh, the Hawaiian Islands are attacked. And uh, again, to give Neville Chamberlain his due, He's correct. Well, failing to a lie, another big takeaway here. What's the result? War. One of the great tragedies of the interwar period is that those Atlantic democracies, the United States, France, Britain, did not cooperate enough. At the end of the First World War, as part of the Treaty of Versailles, the U.S. wanted to give a security guarantee to France. That was rejected by the U.S. Senate and by the American people. American isolationism contributes, contributes to Britain's dire position in facing Nazi Germany. If you don't have the United States to deal with, to help you, to have a security commitment, well, can you stand up to that threat from the East? One of the big takeaways, of course, from the Second World War for American leaders was that we had to make that security commitment, first in the Rio Pact of 1947, and then, of course, the Atlantic Alliance of 1949, and, of course, the agreement in the Atlantic Alliance, Article 5, an attack against any one of its members is considered an attack against all. Again, there was no Atlantic Alliance commitment like that before the Second World War. And it helps explain that Hitler has an opportunity to take one democracy down after another, taking France down in 1940, coming close, if it had not been for Churchill's leadership, taking Britain out in 1940 as well. Again, a very dangerous situation is created when the world's democracies don't form together into a league to preserve the peace. Choice three. Well, if the U.S. won't help you, what do you have to do? 
Well, Neville Chamberlain considered himself a realist. <clears throat> if you can't stand up, if uh, other countries won't stand with you, with these dictator states, well then maybe you have to get on good terms with them. Strike a deal. Can you overcome differences? This is what we call appeasement. Today, we wouldn't use the word appeasement because appeasement is now considered a dirty term. The word that is the best cognate synonym for us today would be accommodation. Let's accommodate someone else. And by accommodating them, you turn them into a responsible stakeholder is what we say today. They become part of the system rather than an enemy of the system. Well, Neville Chamberlain is book of speeches that are collected together by Arthur Bryant in search of peace. The, 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 these speeches need to be read. We read Churchill speeches, right? But you ought to read the counter argument, if you will. And basically in this Neville Chamberlain says, look, we have to accommodate ourselves with the dictator states. How are we going to overthrow these regimes? It will require war. And if we fight a war, will the U.S. help us? No. So again, for him, the realist option is to come to some sort of terms with Hitler's Germany or Imperial Japan or Mussolini's Italy. Can you cut out those spheres of influence? And if you think Neville Chamberlain is bad, Lloyd George in 1936 went on a visit to Germany where he met Hitler. And then he wrote a newspaper article about meeting uh, Hitler. And what did he have to say in that article? Hitler's the George Washington of Germany. This is the man who won the war. Lloyd George's reputation at the end of the First World War, here's the man who won the war, the great war leader against Imperial Germany. And what is he saying now? Why is that? Because he secured Germany's independence from oppressors. What else did he have to say in this article? His popularity among the youth of Germany, that, that is true. He is very strong, Hitler's popularity. The old trust him. Well, maybe, but the young idolize him. Those that are going to be the soldiers, the airmen, and the sailors in the German armed forces in the Second World War. And again, he's worshipped as a national hero because he saved his country. This is what Lloyd George has to say about uh, Hitler. Well, 1938, there was the big crisis over Czechoslovakia, right? Could have been war. Hitler made it clear that he wanted to have the Sudeten Germans, the German-speaking portions of Czechoslovakia, ripped away from the Czech state. And Germans drew up war plans to invade Czechoslovakia. So in the fall of 1938, looks like war is imminent. Neville Chamberlain, using this new technology, flying in the air, a summit. Get on good terms with Hitler. Can they solve the problems of Czechoslovakia without war? And Neville Chamberlain meets with Hitler. And of course, it ends up with the Munich Conference, Munich Agreement. And again, this is what Hitler, uh, Chamberlain is saying about Hitler uh, to his sisters and in his diary. Again, despite that ruthlessness he sees uh, in, in uh, Hitler's face, that he's a man who can be trusted. Well, this shows you some of the dangers of symmetry, right? You know, you think, oh, I've built up a rapport, a good, yeah, maybe not. Maybe he's deceiving you. Hitler's very good at deception. And again, the tumultuous return when Neville Chamberlain comes back waving the piece of paper, and here it is. And again, what's the thesis of this agreement where he has Hitler sign it at the last moment? And again, it's the desires of our two people never to be at war with one another again. Avoid war. No great war again with Germany. Of course, Hitler had this shoved in front of him at the last moment. He didn't want to sign it, but he realized he had to sign it because otherwise he would lose the propaganda battle with Neville Chamberlain. And so he signed it, but he told his intimates around him, he said, that old man with his umbrella ever comes again to Germany. I'm going to throw him down the steps and kick him in front of photographers. Again, is that a relationship of trust? Well, again, Neville Chamberlain is lauded for peace, but in the great speech in the House of Commons, I wish we had some of the film footage the, that we have for a later period of time of the Cold War of this speech in the House of Commons. But Churchill lays out clearly the ideological struggle that's here. 
a struggle at the heart of Western civilization between the Nazi view of the world and democracy. And he highlights the ideological component here. You have to consider the character of the Nazi movement. And what is the Nazi movement? Well, he lays it out in a very clear way. Spurns Christian ethics, cheers barbarous paganism, vaunts a spirit of aggression and conquest, derives perverted pleasure from persecution, again, uses pitiless brutality in the threat of murderous force. All of these things are the attributes of the Nazi movement. And he's laying it out in a very clear and direct way to the British people and to the world. Again, in his speeches, again, collected into battle, there can be no real understanding between British democracy and Nazi power. Well, in a speech in October 1938 to America, broadcast on NBC, Churchill lays out again this ideological struggle. Arms are important. Can't lose the arms race, but it's not enough. You have to have the power of ideas on your side. What do you stand for? Well, again, it's for liberty, democracy. Now, Hitler takes note of the speech. Hitler paid close attention to what Churchill said and did. And in his rebuttal speech of the same month, Hitler highlights that there's been people out there, Churchill, who wants to divide the world into these ideological camps, authoritarian states. And notice that Hitler then qualifies, what does he mean by an authoritarian state? A disciplined state. What does that mean for democracy? They're not disciplined. They're caught up by partisan politics. There's no discipline in that country, whereas Germany is disciplined. Authoritarian regimes are disciplined. Well, a month later, you have the Reichskristallnacht. You have the destruction of Jewish synagogues here, synagogue in Hanover, the looting of Jewish stores, beating up uh, uh, German Jews on the streets. This is showing what Churchill said in his October speech about Nazi power. In January of 1939, in response to a message from President Roosevelt, in a speech to the Reichstag, Hitler lays out this threat, that if the Jews of international finance again bring about a war, and for him, again, it's international finance of the Jews are responsible for British and American foreign policy. Behind the scenes, they're the puppet master. They're controlling with their strings, the marionettes of British and American political leaders, that if they plunge the world into the war, what will the result be? Well, as he says, and here's the German translation, you know, translation into English from the German, it's the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Again, Vernichtung, destruction, annihilation. Can't be clear. Hitler's laying out already the ideas, the conception that's going to lead those railway lines right to Auschwitz. Well, in 1939, the war breaks out. Uh, uh, after Czechoslovakia, the Czech state is destroyed in 19, March of 38, or 39. Churchill again looks vindicated. Everything that he said in his October uh, speeches uh, shows that Nazi Germany is behaving according to what he characterized the Nazi regime. In Britain, he becomes a more popular figure. As you can see, the British public is starting to say there has to be a stand against Germany especially after March of 1939, and the Munich Agreement is destroyed by Hitler. Churchill is the one that has been honest and forthright. The British public are starting to rally behind him. He should be in the government. Hitler had already understood that Churchill was going to be his opponent. In 1937, 1937, he told Ribbentrop that within five years, the British will sort of have a backbone. And when they do, when the British public starts to understand the threat from Germany, what will happen? Churchill will be in power, and Germany will be in a fine net, a mess at that point. And he says he's not going to wait. Again, there's a window of opportunity. He has to strike before Churchill has power. Again, Churchill is the one that will weave a web of coalitions around Germany. He has to strike before Churchill has the power. Well, what's the bottom line, the big takeaway? Appeasement here leads to war. Well, Stalin, we've heard about Stalin and Stalin's Russia, joins up in August of 1939, comrades in crime, with Hitler 
to destroy the Polish state. And in a rapid campaign in September and October, Poland is overrun from the west by the German armies and in the east by the Soviet Red Army. Poland's wiped out. Winston's back. Now with the war on, this iconic photograph from the post, picture post that we're familiar with, he's back at the Admiralty again in Chamberlain's cabinet, standing right behind Neville Chamberlain and with his board of Admiralty there, admirals and senior civil servants. Now in Germany, when it's reported that Churchill's back at the Admiralty, they understand that now Britain is going to be stronger. Why? Because they have a strong leader who's coming into power. And again, this is from Albert Speer's uh, book, Inside the Third Reich. Goering was in talking with Hitler. He comes out. They've heard the news that Churchill is back. Goering just drops down into a chair. And he says, Churchill's in the British government. That means the war is really on. They have a real war on their hands. They're not dealing now just with Neville Chamberlain. They're going to have a real war. Again, Hitler has taken a measure of <laughs> Churchill and sees him as a threat. At first, Churchill said he and Chamberlain were uneasy with each other, but grew closer over time. But already, within a month of the war's outbreak, people are talking about when will Churchill replace Chamberlain? Our ambassador, Joseph Kennedy, says this to his wife Rose in a letter to his wife Rose. If Churchill becomes prime minister, then England's in trouble. That's what our ambassador is, send, is, is thinking about what's going on. Churchill's not a blessing, but actually a curse to Britain. Uh, Churchill, why? He has energy brains, but no judgment. How often is Churchill characterized throughout his life as having no judgment? Again, that's a constant uh, refrain. Well, what does uh, Joseph Chamberlain record in his diary? Look at this. He says, Churchill impressed me that if he blew up the American embassy, he would blame the Germans for it, just so he could get the US into the war. Is this the type of ambassador you want to have at this critical moment in 39 and 40? And of course, the answer is no. And Roosevelt understands this and reaches out to Churchill, former naval person. Joseph Kennedy can't stand the fact that Roosevelt is reaching out, going around the embassy uh, to communicate with uh, Churchill. Well, we've heard about Maisky, Ambassador Maisky from the Soviet Union. Again, he reports, uh, puts in his diary, that there's now fresh blood in the British government because Churchill and Eden have been brought on board. But he also, he has a different view from Joseph Kennedy. He says if this reconstruction doesn't go further, what's the result going to be? Well, Churchill and Eden are going to be isolated hostages and Britain will lose the war. Again, maisky has got a better impression of what needs to be done here. Uh, a better understanding that Churchill has to have more power, not less power. Well, here's the iconic Karsh photograph of Churchill. Let me leave you with just uh, a few thoughts. As I've tried to highlight already, it is important for the world's democracies to stick together in a league. We have to work together the world becomes much more dangerous when the world's democracies don't cooperate with each other. We have to keep that as a vital interest at the center of American foreign policy and grand strategy. That's critical. Another takeaway is that when the world's authoritarian powers start to work together, and you see this with Hitler's Germany and Stalin's Russia, the world becomes a much more dangerous place as much as possible, you have to keep those authoritarian states at each other's throats and not together against us. We also have to be prudent and understand that no matter how much we want peace, peace will come by those who are prepared to stand up for it by investing in what is needed in defense effort to be strong. The weak will not have peace. Thank you very much. Just uh, five minutes for Q and A uh, discussion. Yes, right here. Thank you. Could you please comment on the potential civil 
similarity between the 1930s and his crime. And today, with the aggressiveness, the assertiveness, the combination of China and Russia. The, this, this is a dangerous geopolitical challenge. We saw it during the height of the Cold War when Mao and Stalin were working together. Uh, of course, Nixon, Kissinger were able to break it apart, but they broke apart because Mao and, and uh, Stalin's successors went at odds with each other. Uh, one of our key goals should be to try to break apart Russia from China in any way that we can. Unfortunately, the deal that you might have to cut uh, to get cooperation from uh, Russia is one that we don't want to pay. Uh, I think we have to play a long game here, and we're capable of playing a long game, which is to look to a post-Putin Russia and hope that there might be some openings, just as Churchill saw and was highlighted in the earlier talks in a post-Stalin Russia that you look uh, ahead. George Kennan, who wrote the famous X article about containment, you know, was thinking about uh, change, regime change that comes from inside and dealing with a new generation of leaders. And so I think that's how we have to look at things today. Uh, China has gotten much, much stronger. Its economy, its economic growth has uh, helped fuel a military buildup uh, in some of the latest technologies, in particular precision ballistic missiles uh, and crews that put uh, all of our bases in the Pacific as well as naval forces. They also have a nuclear arsenal that uh, has been growing and getting more powerful. So all of those things we have to uh, make investments in. Uh, to help ensure that there's a, a balance in the Far East. And in addition to that, of course, we have to work with our key allies there, in particular Japan and Australia. Uh, it's just critically important. So thank you. Yeah, I hope that gets to your question. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, do you feel that if Brexit passes that, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Do you feel that if Brexit passes and uh, England breaks away from the EU, uh, that that'll build a stronger relationship between the United States and Britain? I, I, I must confess I am not an expert on uh, Brexit, but looking at uh, European politics as a, as a whole, um, since the end of the Cold War, I think, I look at the transatlantic relationship there, uh, we, we have to uh, revitalize all of those uh, relationships, not just between the special relationship between Britain and the U.S., but also with Germany and the U.S. Um, we, we have to do a better job of confronting uh, the realities that we face uh, of a potential of the threat from Russia. Russia, with its large nuclear arsenal, remains such a grave danger to the U.S. It's uh, really the the existential threat to the U.S. So we have to have a relationship with Russia, and I would prefer it be one that comes from a position of strength when uh, the Atlantic Alliance, the coalition, coheres together, not just on military matters, but also on uh, economic matters with regard to the uh, uh, Russia. Uh, so I don't mean to dodge your question, but uh, I think the whole set of relationships between the U.S. and Europe, we have to do a better job of making that job one in some way. I think we fret so much about Russia and China, we forget that maybe our first job should be to make sure we get along well with our coalition partners, especially the world's democracies. And w Western Europe, again, you know, it is <laughs> democracies, you know, with us. And so we, we th that, that's key. That's the key element there. Thank you. Okay.